been studying black bears here in Pennsylvania for over 20 years. And during that time, we've captured and tagged over 6,000 bears. We've radio collared and monitored the movements on more than 500 bears, many of them for over 10 years. This has been one of the most intensive long-term black bear studies ever carried out anywhere in North America. When we first started studying bears, we felt they were quite aggressive. And being the symbol of wilderness, we also felt that they weren't very adaptable. Like many people, we had a lot of misconceptions about bears based on what we had heard and read. But once the study began, we started gathering information on the bears. Uh, the animal that emerged was incredibly different than the one we had set out to study. We found that they are unbelievably unaggressive and very adaptable if given a chance. And the purpose of this video is to share with you what we've been able to learn about the bears because we realize that public education is absolutely crucial to the future of our bears. There are three species of bears that occur in North America, polar bears, brown bears, and black bears. And on the average, the black bears are the smallest, the least aggressive, and the only bears that occur here in the wild in the eastern United States. Black bears exist throughout much of the forested regions of North America. They're particularly abundant in the boreal forests of Alaska and Canada, and their range extends throughout the Rocky Mountains of western United States, clear into northern Mexico. And here in the Appalachians, in the eastern United States, they occur all the way from Maine to Florida. Black bears occur in about 40 of Pennsylvania's 67 counties, but most of the bears are concentrated in two major locations, the Poconos of the Northeast and the large forested areas of North Central Pennsylvania. To manage bears, we need to know a lot more than just where they are. We need to know things like their vulnerability to hunting, their reproductive success, and habitat requirements. But to do this, we need to be able to identify individuals over time. We need to tag them. But to tag bears, we first need to capture them. We use two types of traps to capture bears, culvert traps and foot snares. This large bear is examining a culvert trap. We lay down a trail of suet and pastries to entice the bear inside the culvert, but to become captured, the bear has to go all the way in and pull on a sack of bait, which we call the trigger bait, that causes the door to fall. The problem is, bears aren't very eager about going in the culvert any further than they absolutely have to. This bear has learned the fine art of stealing our bait without getting caught. Some of the more experienced bears who have been previously captured in culverts have learned that if they pull on the trigger bait, they'll get caught. So they eat everything but the trigger bait and leave. Here's another bear at the same culvert trap that learned to avoid being caught by eating the trigger bait without pulling on it. And we've actually seen other bears hold the culvert door open with their rump while stretching their body and ripping off the trigger bait with their front paw, in which case the door drops after the bear leaves with the bait. One thing is very apparent about bears. They have a great memory, and once they learn something, they often remember it for the rest of their lives. And bears like this one that have learned how culvert traps work will rarely be recaptured in one. 
Here's another bear behaving very much like the previous two, except he lacks experience with culvert traps, and he's a bit less cautious. He makes the fateful mistake of pulling on the trigger bait and gets caught. But in this case, we had to run over and pin the door shut before he actually opened the door and escaped. Because bears learn so fast and their memory is so good, it's necessary for us to use several different types of traps to be able to recapture them. Another device we use for capturing bears is a foot snare, which is what I have here in my hand. And bear foot snares have several advantages over cover traps. First of all, as you can see, they're far more portable, but they can also be concealed. And typically, we attach these snares to a tree like this along a bear trail, such as you see right here. When the bear comes walking down the trail, it actually steps over the log and steps into the snare, which point the snare lassos the bear's paw, and his movements are confined to an area of about six feet around the tree. Once the bear is captured, we need to anesthetize it so we can tag it and collect biological information. The amount of drug we use is based on the estimated weight of the bear we're trying to anesthetize. Larger bears require more drug. Typically, the bear becomes immobilized between five and 10 minutes after injection. And once the drugs take effect, the bear is unable to move and it's also unaware of what's going on. After the bear has been anesthetized and appears to be stable, we begin processing. We attach a numbered metal tag to each ear so we'll always know which bear it is if we recover it in the future. Sometimes ear tags get torn out by other bears while fighting. And this is particularly true of adult males who bite each other's ears while fighting over potential mates during the breeding season. So to maintain their identification, even if the tags are torn out, we tattoo the bear's ear tag number on its upper lip. To determine the age of captured bears, we pull their first upper premolar tooth. This tooth is very small with the portion erupting above the gum line, only about the size of the head of a wooden match. Once the tooth is pulled, a paper thin cross section is cut, stained and mounted on a glass slide. By looking at this tooth cross section under a microscope, we can see growth rings called cementum annuli. And there's one deposited for each winter that the bears live. We can determine the bear's age by counting the rings in the same way as determining the age of a section tree. We weigh the bears using block and tackle and scales. By plotting the weights of bears with respect to their age, we can compare growth rates of bears from this area with those of other areas, like nurses measuring students in elementary school to see how your child compares with the national average. We've learned that the bears of Pennsylvania are growing more rapidly and obtaining heavier weights than for any other area studied. For example, throughout most of North America, adult males average less than 300 pounds. In contrast, adult males in Pennsylvania are averaging nearly 500 pounds. This is a bear radio collar, and embedded in this lower section is a transmitter and battery pack that powers it. And each of these collars transmits a signal of a specific frequency that we can tune into so we can actually determine which bear we're following. By using a receiver like this, we can actually hear that signal. That beeping sound you hear is the signal that's being transmitted out of this collar right here. Now the strength of that signal and also the direction that we receive it on using an antenna like this tells us approximately how far and what direction that bear is from where we are. And by using this kind of equipment, we can get into the forest like this and actually observe the behavior of bears. We can go out and find them in their dens. The actual distance that we can hear the signal is determined by line of sight. If we're up in a plane 3,000 feet, we might be able to pick up this signal from 15 miles away. But if we're on the ground like this in rugged terrain, and the bear is den in a rock cavity over a knoll, we might only pick it up 200 yards away. But once we place a collar like this on a bear, we can follow their movements for over two years. And nothing has helped us with this research in understanding more about bears as much as these radio collars have.
Throughout most of the study, we've had 50 or more bears instrumented at any given time. And because the bears travel over such large areas, it's been necessary to use aircraft to locate them. One of the questions we'd set out to answer was, how large of an area does a bear use? The question seemed simple enough, but as with so many biological questions, the answer turned out to be a bit more complex than we had anticipated. It's influenced by sex of the bear, season of the year, food abundance, and many other factors. In biological terminology, the area an animal uses in search of its food, cover, mate, and other needs is referred to as its home range. Male bears use much larger areas than females. Length across home ranges for males average 12 miles as compared to only five miles for females. And in terms of area, male home ranges averaged about 60 square miles as compared to only 10 square miles for females. Another fact we substantiated was that once adult bears established home ranges, they generally spent most of their time for the rest of their lives in the same general area, with one small exception. If food was scarce in their home range during the fall, they often traveled 20 or more miles away to areas where food was more abundant, sometimes to ridges bountiful with beech nuts or acorns, sometimes to cornfields or even garbage dumps. They'd remain in the area of abundant food for several weeks or more, fattening up for the winter, but always returning to their home range before denning. One of the things we were interested in learning more about was how movement patterns of bears might change during different seasons of the year. We were wondering if bears became more active during the breeding season, or how much the movements of females might be influenced by having to travel with their less mobile cubs. We learned that areas used by females with cubs changed dramatically during the year. For the first month after leaving their dens in the spring, females with newborn cubs only used a few acres. But as the cubs grew and became more mobile, they used much larger areas. Home ranges of females with cubs continued to increase throughout spring and summer, and by fall, they were using 10 square miles or more. During the breeding season, adult males and adult solitary females, the breeding segment of the population, used much larger areas and traveled greater distances per day than during any other time of year. And by synchronizing their greatest activity during the breeding season, bears undoubtedly increase their chances of finding prospective mates. This should be particularly important in ensuring successful mating in areas where bears are far and few between. But bears have more than just this one trick to increase their chances of successful breeding. Once females come into estrus and are receptive for mating, they may stay in estrus for several weeks, which gives them a lot longer time to find a mate. Black bears are different from most other mammals in that females typically only breed once every two years. The reason for this two-year reproductive cycle is because mothers remain with their cubs for nearly a year and a half. It's late June, the peak of the breeding season, and adult males are competing fiercely for the rare opportunity to mate. Fights between adult males often result in facial scars, cuts, and bite wounds, but fatal injuries are rare. Throughout most of the year, females keep their distance from adult males, and for good reason. Occasionally, adult males are very aggressive toward females and sometimes actually kill their cubs. 
But during the breeding season, mating females have already separated from their offspring, and they gradually let their guard down. They allow the persistent male closer contact, which results in extended periods of ritualized fights and foreplay. Once female bears come into estrus and become receptive to males, they mate many times over a period of a few days. It's believed that stimulation of repeated matings is required for a female to ovulate, a process where her eggs are released from the ovaries and travel down the reproductive tract for possible fertilization. In one case, over a period of an hour and a half, we watched a female bear mate with three different males. Under these conditions, we suspect that different cubs from the same litter may have different fathers. For Pennsylvania black bears, most breeding took place during late June and early July. However, mating spanned four full months, occurring from mid-May all the way through mid-September. Once the mating season is over, most adult solitary females are pregnant, and their attention is redirected to the arduous task of finding enough food to not only survive the winter without eating, but also to nurse their cubs of the coming year. The birthing period of bears is one aspect of their biology where there's very little factual information available, particularly from bears in the wild. Many publications list late January and early February as a time when cubs are born, but this is based on a scarcity of evidence and primarily from captive bears in zoos. We'd been hearing the cries of newborn cubs in maternal dens as early as the first week of January, so according to the literature, our bears were giving birth earlier than expected. So we decided to try and answer the question, when are cubs born in Pennsylvania? To do this, we trapped bears during the summer and collared potentially pregnant females. And then we radio tracked them to their dens in early winter. Once we confirmed that the female was in the den, we returned every few days to listen for the sounds of newborn cubs. In this case, my assistant Jake Stunzi is using a biotic ear and headphones to listen in on a family of den bears. The sounds of crying newborn cubs is the obvious telltale sign that birth has occurred. During our study, we determined birth dates for 143 litters. All the cubs were born between the 1st and the 27th of January. Learning when cubs were born was only the first step in unraveling the mysteries of what goes on in winter dens.
Less than 50 yards from here is a mother bear den. She gave birth to cubs yesterday. There's almost nothing known about cubs at the time of birth, and that's why we're here today to answer some of those questions. To the best of my knowledge, what you're about to see has never been filmed anywhere in the world before. Can I get the cups? Oh my God, look at Oh my God, are they tiny, look at them. Watch your hand, watch your hand. Looks like we have three here. Okay. Keep moving. Okay. okay, cover them up. Let's take them back, we'll start processing. Get ready with a stretcher. We want the stretcher in, we'll take the mother out. This cub is one day old, it was born yesterday. His eyes are closed. His ears are non-functional. Their ears are really just earbuds at this point. Uh, this little guy, he can't see, obviously. He can't hear. We've tested them, we know they can't smell either. But we know that they migrate toward warm objects and away from cold. We also know from scanning mother bears with uh, infrared cameras that the greatest heat loss on the mother is on her nipples and mammary. And so these little guys at birth use this heat-seeking behavior to find their nourishment at their mother's breast. We think that this uh, heat-seeking behavior increases the chances of survival so that uh, they can uh, find their meal because the mothers are hibernating and are not all that active, quite lethargic. And so the little cubs have to tend to their own needs in that way. The hair length on cubs at birth is very consistent. All of them have about one-tenth of an inch of hair all over their bodies. Unlike most other babies, like human babies, hair length can be extremely variable. But in the case of cubs, the developmental period in the uterus is only six weeks long. And all these cubs have between one and three millimeters of hair. So there's very little variation. And we're trying to find ways of estimating the age of a cub. If you don't know when it was born, can you find a way to determine how old it might have been? And so we took body measurements on cubs every week, up to 10 weeks of age. And the characteristic that best predicts how old a cub is, believe it or not, is hair length. This little fellow weighs about 12 ounces. We've measured 36 of them in the last few years that were less than three days of age. They only average 12 ounces, but their mothers average 233 pounds. So the mothers are averaging about 280 times heavier than the cubs. And to give you some idea of uh, what this would be like in human terms, um, babies would average about less than half a pound at birth if they were in similar proportions as these bears are. One scientist, uh, Dr. Leach, looked at 114 different species of mammals and found that bear cubs were the smallest in proportion to their mother of any other species, ranging all the way from bats to whales. And so a legitimate question that a lot of people ask is, why are cubs so small at birth? Uh, most of these larger animals have gestation periods of seven to nine months. Black bears uh, have a seven month gestation from the time they breed until the cubs are born, but they're delayed in planters. What that means is though the eggs are fertilized last summer, this little cub did not implant on its mother's uterus until about six weeks ago. So it's only developed for six weeks that's why these are so tiny at birth. For the first few months of the cubs' lives, from January through March, they never leave the den, and their only nourishment is their mother's milk. They're kept warm by cuddling with her, and most of their time is spent nursing and sleeping. By the time the denning season is near an end, the cubs have grown to about five pounds. Their eyes are open, and they spend much of their time playing with each other and sometimes even playing with their mother. Usually around the first week of April, the mother leaves the den with her cubs and they build a nest of brows and leaves at the base of a large tree, often a large hemlock or white pine along a drainage. It's at these locations where cubs learn to climb trees. 
The mother and cubs develop a repertoire of vocalizations to communicate with each other. Mothers will woof to send their cubs up trees to escape possible danger, and she'll give a series of grunts to call them back down. And cubs may whine or cry to attract her attention. As summer progresses, the cubs begin feeding on berries and are gradually weaned. By July, the cubs are capable of surviving without their mother, though they'll remain with her for nearly another year. They start developing a long, lanky appearance, and their ears look disproportionately large for their head. From midsummer on, the cubs grow rapidly, and by late fall are difficult to distinguish from their mother in some cases. The family stops feeding, usually during December, and finds a den where they all crawl in and curl up together for the winter. When spring comes, they emerge from the den and travel together, usually until about late May or early June. And at that time, in response to hormone changes in her body, the mother becomes less maternal, sometimes even chasing the yearlings away. The family breaks up with the mother going her way and the yearlings splitting up and fending for themselves. The female comes into estrus again and mates with another male, ending one two-year reproductive cycle and beginning another. So after the family breaks up, what happens to the yearlings? Where do they go, and what do they do? To answer these questions, we captured, radio instrumented, and followed entire families, mothers and their yearlings. This is called a study of dispersal, or natural stocking. What we soon learned was that what happened depended on the sex of the offspring. Young females were very sedentary. They spent the rest of their lives in or near their mother's home range. In contrast, between one and a half and two and a half years of age, nearly all young males would leave the area where they were raised and disperse between 10 and 80 miles away. In most cases, once the little males disperse, they would never come in contact with their mother or any other female relative again. Nearly all black bears from eastern North America have black fur but that's not the case everywhere. In Pennsylvania, less than 1% have fur any color other than black. In Minnesota, about 6% of their black bears are various shades of brown, while in parts of Arizona, Colorado, and other desert regions of southwestern United States, over 80% of the black bears have brown or blonde colored fur. In hot desert regions, where there's little shade and summer temperatures climb to over 100 degrees, Bears with lighter colored fur have a distinct advantage in keeping cooler and being able to feed during more hours of the day than those with black fur. Hair color of bears is genetically controlled as it is in humans and other mammals. And even different cubs in the same litter may have different colored fur. Black bears are the largest carnivores of the Eastern United States, but people's overestimation of their size is almost legendary. The actual size of bears depends on the sex and age of the bear, season of the year, and food abundance. In general, males grow much larger than females. Older bears tend to be heavier, and they tend to be heaviest in the fall, especially during years when food is abundant. Most adult female black bears in Pennsylvania weigh between 150 and 300 pounds, while most adult males weigh over 400 pounds. The heaviest female we ever captured during this study weighed 454 pounds, the heaviest male was 650. However, almost every year, we weigh harvested adult male black bears at check stations between 650 and 700 pounds. One question I often ask is, how old can bears live to be? Over the past two decades, we've radio instrumented over 500 different bears. Some individuals were monitored for over 10 years, but we were never able to answer this question. Amazingly, not even one of all these instrumented bears were ever determined to die of natural causes. 
Many bears avoided death until their mid to late teens, and then were either run over by a car, shot for damage, or harvested. The oldest male we ever worked with was 20 years old when he was run over by a motorcycle. The oldest female was 23 when she was shot during hunting season. One common fallacy is that bears have notoriously poor vision, but studies have indicated that black bears are not colorblind, and when you work with bears in the field as we have, it soon becomes obvious that their vision is much better than what most people realize. They often detect movements even from relatively long distances. Many people live in bear country their entire lives, yet never see a bear. That's because bears are very inconspicuous. By day, they spend much of their time bedded in dense cover, they rarely vocalize, and do most of their traveling at night. Though you may never see a bear, you're likely to see sign of where they've been, if you're observant and know what to look for. One obvious form of bear sign you may see is claw marks on the bark of trees that bears have climbed. And a likely place to find this is in beech groves. The bark of the American beech is smooth and light gray in color. Bears often climb these trees to feed on ripening beech nuts before they drop in the fall. Dark linear scars created by the bear's claws remain visible for many years. One way you can tell if bears are living in an area is to check for claw marks on the bark of evergreen trees along streams and wetlands. Mothers with cubs spend a great deal of time climbing and resting in white pine and hemlock trees found along drainages. Bears have even more of a problem staying cool than we do in the summer for a variety of reasons. They have a dense coat of fur, often a thick layer of fat, small surface area, and large body mass, all which prevent them from effectively dissipating heat. In compounding this overheating problem, many of the bears are relentlessly pursuing mates during the hottest days of summer. Black bears don't have the option to retreat to air-conditioned rooms as we do. They cool off in wallows, like this one. But relief from heat is not their only consolation. Wallows also provide bears with some temporary protection from the multitudes of biting insects. The best place to find bear wallows are along the edges of wetlands. How bears behave around water is determined by whether they need to cool off or stay warm. When they're hot, they bathe. But when they're cool, they actually avoid water. Bears lose a great deal of heat through their foot pads and of course, can control this heat loss to some extent by where they put their feet. Look at this yearling bear hopping from hummock to hummock, searching for food in a wetland while trying to keep his feet dry. Here's another bear wallow showing a lot of use. And based on the turbidity of the water and the mud stains in the grass all over the banks, you can see that a bear has just recently left here. These wallows receive their greatest amount of use between June and August. And if you're lucky enough to find a wallow like this and you're observant, you're probably going to see a lot of other bear sign in the immediate area. For example, like right here, you can see this track in the mud where a bear has stepped down and made a depression. Now, if you measure the width of that track, it can give you some indication of the size of the bear. If the track is five inches or wider, for example, it's probably not a female. Uh, females rarely have a foot up to five inches in width. If it's six inches or wider, it's an adult male, and in this state, in Pennsylvania, it probably will weigh over 400 pounds. This is a beautiful example of a bear trail, and as you can see, it consists of a series of staggered depressions that average about 22 inches apart. Now, the reason this pattern develops is that when the bears come down this trail, they'll step precisely in the same print each time. Their rear feet will follow their front feet, and as they walk, they naturally will step exactly in the same place. This is a bear marker tree. And you can see where a bear has stood up on its hind legs and bit the bark off of this tree between six and seven feet above the ground. And also, if you look carefully on the bark, you'll see a lot of hair, bear hair on the side where he's rubbed on the tree. And each summer during the breeding season, male bears go around and mark many trees like this. When they actually mark the tree, they stand up on their hind legs and they lean back against it and tip their head back and they bite the bark and they take their claw marks. And you can see here where he's been clawing. 
and claw back over their head, and they rub all over this, leaving their scent and sign. And a story or a myth you always hear is that the bear who bites the highest will scare away all the other males and obtain breeding rights on all the females in this area. I don't believe that's true because uh, if the bear wanted to, as well as they could climb, if, if I were a bear, I'd climb all the way to the top and chew the top right off this tree, and that'd be the end of the game. But breeding rights in bears, I think, are determined the same way as they are in most other polygamous species, and that's by fighting. The most aggressive, dominant males will do most of the breeding. And so we feel that marker trees like this serve a very similar purpose uh, as scrapes do in white-tailed deer, where bucks will leave their sign and scent and meet does there for mating purposes. Another form of sign indicating that bears have used an area is the presence of bear scats. By examining the contents of these scats, biologists can determine what bears eat. It's not the most glamorous part of a biologist's job, but it does help them understand what foods are important to bears during the different seasons of the year. It's not only the bears that benefit from fruits of plants they eat. The plants may benefit as well. When bears consume fruits of some plants, they don't chew the seeds. As the seeds move through the digestive system of the bear, they are prepared for germination and, of course, are eventually deposited where sometimes new plants will grow. In this interrelationship, bears help plants disperse their seeds and inadvertently stock their forest habitats with future foods for future bears. Here's another form of bear sign that you can often find along bear trails where a bear has flipped a rock out of its original resting place and in doing so it exposes a lot of grubs and insects that live beneath the rock which of course the bear feeds upon. One of the exciting things about bear sign is that it tells a story. And whether it be a wallow or a marker tree or a track in the mud or even a rock flipped over like this, it's proof positive that a bear definitely was here. And most of us will never see a bear while we're out there walking in the forest, but if we're observant, we may often find these kinds of bear sign. And I think it can add adventure and excitement to our trips, knowing that even though we didn't see the bear, we definitely were in bear country. About the time winter's blanket of snow melts away, exposing the forest floor, the bears emerge from their dens and begin feeding for the first time in months. Ironically, food shortages for some animals during winter sometimes result in food abundance for bears in spring. White-tailed deer are plentiful throughout most of the bear range in Pennsylvania, and after long winters of particularly deep snow, many thousands of deer starve to death, providing bears with some of their first meals in the spring. Also during early spring, bears begin feeding on newly emerging vegetation. One preferred plant, which is very high in protein this time of year, is skunk cabbage. It grows in wetlands and is one of the first plants to emerge in the spring. Bears also feed on young grasses and climb into the treetops to feed on newly sprouting leaves. Later in spring, bird nests are sometimes raided for their eggs, such as this nest of a wild turkey. Bears also spend considerable amounts of time and energy looking for insects to eat. They often flip rocks and rip apart rotten stumps and logs, searching for insects and their eggs. At times when food is scarce and a family of bears finds some nourishment, squabbles often break out between competing siblings. During late May and early June, before they've developed the strength and endurance to keep up with their mother, white-tailed fawns are quite vulnerable to bear predation. Summer is the season of berries for Pennsylvania bears. June berries, found throughout the hardwood forest, are some of the earliest berries available. 
followed by blackberries and raspberries, which abound in many areas of early forest succession. Blueberries are particularly abundant in Pennsylvania's wetlands and represent one of the most important foods for bears during the summer. As fall approaches, the appetites of bears become insatiable. Some studies have shown that they consume over 20,000 calories a day. During this season, many of Pennsylvania's adult males are gaining over two pounds a day. One bear we studied gained 128 pounds in 60 days. Acorns, beech nuts, cherries, and fruits of many other plants make this possible in preparation for a long winter starvation. Winter is a time when food is in short supply for most animals that live here in the northern temperate forests. Different survival strategies have evolved for different animals to cope with this extended famine. Many of the birds migrate south to a warmer climate where food is more accessible. Squirrels feed on caches of nuts they stored in the fall when food was relatively abundant. But bears, on the other hand, go into their dens and sleep for most of the winter, using their fat reserves to meet their basic energy needs until the foods of spring become available. People often ask if bears actually hibernate. The term hibernation is usually reserved for animals like woodchucks, whose heart rate and respiration decrease to a point difficult to even detect. Their body temperature plummets from nearly 100 degrees to the mid-30s, just above freezing. When an animal is in this hibernative state, it's incapable of even moving. In contrast, when you look in at a denned bear, it's often looking back out at you. Den bears are capable of running within seconds of being disturbed. During winter sleep, the bear's body temperature only declines by six or eight degrees, and their decrease in heart rate and respiration is much less dramatic than the animals classified as true hibernators. What many people don't realize is that woodchucks and the other true hibernators emerge from hibernation every 10 to 15 days, eat from their food cache, urinate, defecate, then drop back into hibernation again in a matter of hours. In contrast, bears go into their state of winter sleep gradually, over weeks, but will spend up to six months without eating, drinking, or excreting. The answer to the age-old question, do bears hibernate? appears to be one of semantics. It depends on how you define hibernation. And many ecologists feel the term winter sleep better describes the bear's activity. But what we decide to call these periods of inactivity is largely academic. What's far more important to realize is that each of the animals that live here in this environment have evolved their own unique strategy for surviving a long winter with little or no food. By monitoring bears with telemetry, we were able to determine when and how long they denned. Pregnant females were usually the first to start denning, often by mid-October, and the last to leave with their cubs in the spring, usually during April. Most other bears started denning during December and were out by mid-March. Deep snow accumulations can cause bears to start denning earlier or remain in their dens later. But it's not just the snow depths or cold weather that causes bears to go into dormancy it's the lack of food, for even in southern Florida, they den for several months in the winter when food is scarce. It appears to be a matter of energetics. When bears have to spend more calories to find food than the food is worth, then it makes more sense to become dormant and live off their stored body fat. We've learned that bears den in a wide variety of structures, but one of the most common places where they spend the winter is in a rock cavity like this. Bear dens are a lot smaller than most people realize. In fact, the average entrance to a bear den is only 17 inches in diameter. 
So let's go down inside and take a look at what it's like on the interior of a bear den. This den was used by a female and five yearlings. Over 800 pounds of bear spent the winter in here, and that would be comparable to five people my size packing into this small space. But it makes sense for bears to use small cavities like this because their escaping body heat warms up this inner chamber and saves them valuable energy. But perhaps even more importantly, it increases the survival of cubs being born nearly hairless during the coldest days of the year. And it's rock cavities like these that provide bears with some of the best protection against the harsh elements of winter. Nearly a third of all bear dens in Pennsylvania consists of nothing more than just a nest on top of the ground like this in thick cover. Typically the bears construct these nests either in rejuvenating clear cuts or in a wetland like we have here. And very often they're built in conjunction with things like this, like a blowdown to protect them against the wind. And you'll notice when they start to construct the nest itself, they'll go out and bite off hundreds of these twigs and uh, line them up to actually form this donut-shaped nest. But um, when they go to finish it, they actually line the central portion with leaves, or as you can see in this case, with grasses for the bedding material itself. The one thing unique about these kinds of uh, dens, these nests, is that when they're disturbed, the bear will simply just leave and go on out into another section of the swamp and create another nest in a matter of an hour or two. Bear dens are often associated with trees. They den in hollow cavities of tree trunks, both at ground level and higher up. They also den under the root cavities of trees partially blown over, or in brush piles created from trees that have been cut down. In this scene, a 320-pound female bear is denned under this brush pile. And as you can see, the bear is so well insulated that snow temporarily accumulates on her fur. Many bears dig a huge hole in the ground to den, like an overgrown woodchuck. These excavation dens create a special problem for bears. During winter thaws or heavy rains, they often flood or cave in. We've documented that approximately 20% of all cubs born in excavation dens here in Pennsylvania die either due to drowning or cave-ins. In addition to traditional kinds of dens, we've found bears spending the winter in some very surprising places. Last year, a female bear crawled under this hunting cabin and den. She raked in most of the leaves from the yard and built this very comfortable nest and chewed off these flora joists, providing additional room for her head. But even more amazing, the man that owns this cabin would stay here on weekends and he never knew that this bear was denned less than three feet beneath his bed. When you're following the radio signal of an instrumented bear during winter, you can't help but wonder where it's going to lead you. Sometimes you follow the signal right to a house and find out the bear died, someone found it and brought the collar home as a souvenir. But other times the bear is still wearing the collar and it simply decided to den under the house. From our perspective, this seems like an unlikely place for a bear to den. But from the bear's perspective, it's a great place to spend the winter. Under the house, the bear has fantastic protection from the wind, the snow, and the rain. At the time I found the bear family den under this house, the owner came out to see what I was doing in his yard. When I told him a mother bear and cubs were den beneath his house, he couldn't believe it. But one quick peek with a flashlight and the evidence was irrefutable. The man said he noticed some rocks had been moved under the porch and thought that a raccoon had done it. But once I explained there was no real danger in the bears being there, he became very protective of the bear family and actually requested that they not be disturbed. The bears stayed the rest of the winter and left in the spring. In the past two decades, we've located bears den under houses nearly every winter, and the homeowners often never knew that the bears were ever there. In one case, we were summoned to a farmer's field in southwestern Pennsylvania where a bear had tunneled back into a huge hay bale. This was one of the best insulated and most comfortable dens I'd ever seen. We had one female bear den under Interstate 84. 
She crawled into a 30-inch diameter concrete drainage pipe 136 feet long, built a nest, and gave birth to three cubs. The bear's selection of these man-made dens is a vivid testimony to their amazing adaptability. One common belief is that bears reuse the same den year after year. This den was used during the winter of 1975. I've been back here and checked it every winter since, and it's never been reused, and that's typical. We've learned that only about 4% of the dens are reused in any given year. And of those that are reused, only half are reused by the same bear. A question we've pondered is, why don't bears reuse their dens more often? And there are several possible explanations. If the same dens were occupied annually, then potential predators like humans, wolves, or even other bears might frequently check these active dens for prey, and bears reusing dens wouldn't live long. Also, the spread of disease and parasites might cause more of a problem if bears reuse the same dens each winter. We were able to learn a great deal about the reproductive success of female bears by going into their dens each spring, immobilizing the mothers, weighing them, and inspecting their cubs. We learned at what age females began to produce cubs, how frequently they gave birth, how many cubs were in their litters, and how many of those cubs would survive their first year of life. It soon became obvious in our study that the mother's nutrition had a profound influence on nearly every aspect of her reproductive performance. In areas like Alaska or Montana where foods are relatively scarce, studies have shown that black bears grow slowly and females may not successfully breed until at least seven or even eight years of age. And in some cases, they may only raise one litter of cubs every three or four years. Here in Pennsylvania, where foods are abundant, over 80% of our two and a half year old females are breeding successfully, and over 95% of all adult females are producing cubs every other year. And not only are they breeding at earlier ages and during shorter intervals, they're also producing larger litters. Throughout much of North America, litters of two are most common. Litters of four and five are almost unheard of. But here in Pennsylvania, litters of three are most common. Nearly half of all our litters consist of three cubs. Litters of four are about as common as litters of two, and litters of five, believe it or not, are about as common as litters of one. And after processing over 500 cubs out of spring dens like this, we've determined that there's a very significant relationship between the mother's age, her weight, and the number of cubs that she produces. And what we've found is that it is, it is the heavier, older females that are producing the larger litters. While we have nursing females anesthetized, we collect a small sample of milk. This bear milk is very high in energy with a fat content of about 25% compared to cow milk which is typically only about 4%. We've been supplying bear milk samples to a research team at the National Zoo in Washington DC and they're studying its composition so they can create a synthetic milk formula to hand rear giant pandas which has never been done anywhere in the world before. We know that cubs weighing less than four pounds by early April are much less likely to survive than heavier cubs. This little guy weighs a little over eight pounds, appears to be very healthy, and has a great chance of surviving. But not all the cubs are so fortunate. After processing hundreds of cubs during spring den work, we've documented two major trends in the weights and survival of cubs. Cubs in larger litters tend to be lighter, probably because they have to share their mother's limited milk supply with more litter mates. And second, cubs born to young mothers producing their first litters tend to be much lighter as well, and probably because those young mothers are not producing as much milk. As a result, mortality is less than 20% for cubs born to older females, while more than half of all the cubs born to young females will die of malnutrition before they're even old enough to consume solid foods. Today is March 26th. This bear weighs 216 pounds. We know from past experience on weighing bears at the beginning of denning period and at the end that she should have lost about 35% of her body weight, which means that late last October when this bear crawled into the den, she probably weighed about 332 pounds. Bears are unique from nearly all other animals in a number of ways they've adapted for winter dormancy. 
They can go up to six months without eating, drinking, urinating, or defecating. If we tried that, we'd die of urea poisoning in a matter of days. But while in dormancy, bears can break down urea and recycle it into proteins. A better understanding of how bears do this may help doctors find a cure for some forms of kidney disease. Bears are thought to be the only animals in the world that don't develop osteoporosis, a condition of bone degeneration, even though they're inactive for months at a time. Humans and nearly all other animals develop osteoporosis after periods of inactivity, such as bedridden hospital patients or even astronauts living in an environment of weightlessness. We've been cooperating with several medical research teams to help them learn more about how bears accomplish some of their physiological miracles of winter dormancy. In this way, bears may help doctors find cures for many human disorders. It's ironic to think the animal feared by so many may someday help save the lives of thousands of people. Each year in Pennsylvania, about a dozen orphan black bear cubs are turned in to the Game Commission. Nearly all orphans are a result of human disturbance during or shortly after the denning season. Orphans are sometimes created when lumbering or construction projects destroy dens, or when forest fires separate mothers from their cubs. But in Pennsylvania, most orphans are a result of well-meaning hikers who pick up cubs, thinking they've been permanently abandoned when in fact their mother only ran off temporarily while the people were too near the den or David. You should never pick up cubs in the wild unless you absolutely know the mother has been killed. Early in our study, all orphans were given to zoos or menageries where they remained for the rest of their lives. But we were interested in finding ways of returning orphan cubs back to the wild where they belong. One technique we developed to do this was to place orphan cubs at the entrance of dens containing nursing mothers. The following scene is typical of a foster mother's response to an orphan cub placed at the entrance of her den. Nearly all orphan cubs given to foster mothers in dens were successfully adopted. But after the denning season, when we attempted to introduce orphans to foster mothers, they nearly always killed the orphan cubs. We noticed they always smelled the orphan just before they killed it. But we learned we could trick foster mothers into adopting orphans by either immobilizing the mother and placing Vicks vapor rub in her nostrils, or by just rubbing Vicks all over the orphan's body prior to giving it to her. Using these techniques, we've returned over 100 orphan bear cubs back into the wilds of Pennsylvania. Because of these results, we wondered how often mother bears adopt the cubs of other females in the wild. To determine this, we tagged and monitored over 600 two-month-old cubs from over 200 different litters. What we documented was that not even one case of natural adoption occurred. It's probably no accident that mother bears rarely adopt the cubs of other females. Bears nurse their young like all mammals. The mother has a very limited supply of milk, which is energetically expensive for her to produce. If she adopted every cub she came in contact with, she wouldn't have enough milk to raise them all, and her cubs, as well as the orphans, might die. Another legitimate question is, why will they adopt orphans in the winter den, but not after leaving the den? 
Perhaps this is because it was never necessary for mother bears to discriminate between her cubs and the cubs of other females during the denning season. And that's because under natural conditions, nursing females would never come in contact with cubs of other females until after emerging from their dens. It's likely this evolutionary strategy of adoption discrimination came about because it increased the chances of mother bears successfully raising the greatest number of their own cubs. The lives of black bears are very much tied to the forest. When Native Americans were the only people that lived here, much of Pennsylvania looked like this. Huge expanses of virgin forest and bears were common throughout the state. Bears and other forest animals were free to travel great distances without human interference or even barriers. But as human settlements came to Penn's Woods, much of Pennsylvania's forests were converted to farmland, especially in the southern part of the state. And in these areas, black bears and much of the other forest wildlife disappeared, while farm wildlife such as cottontail rabbits and bobwhite quail prospered. Nearly all of the virgin forests were cut down in the late 1800s, and now, a century later, another forest is maturing. Many of the small country farms that once invaded the forest are no longer active, and they're reverting once again back to woodlands. And with this reforestation, the black bear and other forest wildlife is reclaiming its former range. But what are the habitat requirements of black bears? What do they need to survive? Trees are extremely important to black bears. As we've already seen, they provide bears with a variety of sites to den in the wintertime. But they also use trees to escape enemies, like coyotes, domestic dogs, humans, or even other bears. In addition to that, they often climb trees for food. In the spring of the year like this, they climb up into the canopy, and they feed on buds and freshly emerging leaves like this. In the fall, they climb into the tops of trees to feed on acorns and beech nuts and black cherries when they begin to ripen. They also like to climb up into the tops of trees to spend a great deal of time in the middle of day just resting. Many people inappropriately equate lumbering, or the cutting of trees, as bad for bears and other forest wildlife. But that is clearly not the case. It isn't a matter of being good or bad, it's a matter of how it's done. Large hollow trees should be left standing, because they're used as den sites for bears and many other mammals. And they also provide cavity nesting sites for birds of the forest. Also, treetops left on the ground after lumbering provide wildlife with dense cover and potential den sites. If cutting is done in moderation and interspersed throughout the forest, it can benefit bears by providing dense escape cover and additional food. The thick vegetation that results in rejuvenating clear cuts is an important place for bears to hide, and some of the new plants that come up, like blackberry, provide valuable food for the bears. Wetlands are of supreme importance to black bears. They provide almost impenetrably dense escape cover, allowing bears to live near humans, yet escape their disturbances. The black bear is only one species of many that depends heavily on wetlands for survival. River otters, snowshoe hares, wintering white-tailed deer, and a long list of reptiles, amphibians, and birds are also closely tied to this valuable habitat. Some rare and unusual insect-eating plants are also unique to these wetlands, such as the round-leaf sundew and the pitcher plant. Wetlands are not just important to wildlife and plants, they're important to humans as well. 
Wetlands prevent flooding of drainage systems, they act as filters for pollutants, and they maintain water tables. These are issues which are extremely important today, but issues which will be even more important in the future as our water resources become even more critical. Less than 2% of Pennsylvania is made up of wetlands, yet over 70% of the radio locations of bears we studied were found in this type of habitat. Unfortunately, over half of all wetlands found in the United States have already been drained or destroyed during this century. And even more alarming, the destruction continues. Conservationists must be ever vigilant to ensure that our remaining wetlands are protected from further encroachment. Once drained, their value to wildlife is forever destroyed. As human populations continue to increase, further commercial, industrial, and residential development and encroachment is inevitable. But we need to take great care to plan our development to minimize environmental impact. We need to protect and preserve our wetlands, not just for wildlife, but for ourselves as well. The purchase and preservation of state game lands, which include wetlands, continues to be a priority of the Pennsylvania Game Commission. In this way, we're investing in the future of bears and many other animals, providing a place where wildlife can survive and future generations of people can study and enjoy nature. Of all the things we've learned about black bears here in Pennsylvania, nothing has impressed us more than their incredibly unaggressive nature. We've had many thousands of encounters with bears, crawling into hundreds of occupied dens, even holding squawking cubs that we were processing while their mothers were watching. Several of us on the research team have been jumped on, we've been run over, and even knocked down by bears. Stop but this Stop usually occurred when the bears were trying to escape from their dens or traps that we were blocking. Watch it. Watch it. We've been charged hundreds of times, but none of us have ever been seriously injured. That's no tribute to our judgment or wisdom, but rather to the bears' amazingly unaggressive disposition. There's no question that black bears have tremendous power and potential to inflict serious injury or even to kill. In fact, there are about 25 documented cases where black bears have killed humans in this century, although nearly all of these fatalities occurred in remote areas of Alaska and western Canada. We're unaware of any documented human fatalities caused by black bears in Pennsylvania or any other eastern coastal state in over 100 years. Here in the eastern United States, where bears and humans have had to coexist for several centuries, the most aggressive bears have been killed for many generations, and only the least aggressive bears have been allowed to survive. Black bears are far less aggressive than their close relatives, the brown or grizzly bears. And studies have shown that black bears are not only less likely to attack humans, but if they do, they're far less likely to cause serious injury. A frequently asked question is, why are brown bears so much more aggressive than black bears? And one explanation is in their evolution of different defense strategies. Black bears have evolved a strategy of running and climbing trees to escape danger. But brown bears, on the other hand, live in areas where there are very few trees, plus their long claws prevent them from being effective climbers. So brown bears adapted a strategy of dealing with danger by confronting it aggressively. One of the most common questions we're asked is, what should I do if I see a bear? Some people suggest that you should climb a tree. Well, that might work well to avoid grizzlies, but if you think you can outclimb a black bear, watch this. Black bears are not only good tree climbers, they're great swimmers as well, and can run over 30 miles an hour. In most cases, if the bear wanted to catch you, he could do it in a matter of seconds. The fact of the matter is, so long as you're not hand feeding a bear or teasing it in some way, in most cases you're safe to just watch the bear from a distance. If you do get too close to a bear, they'll usually let you know by giving you some signs of aggression. They fold their ears back, lunge forward, and slam the ground with their forepaw. Occasionally they make short charges and woof as they slam the ground, but it's extremely rare that they'll ever make contact with humans. If a black bear is aggressive toward you, you should move away from it. If it continues to be aggressive and follows you, you should act aggressively. You should stand tall, wave your hands, and make as much noise as possible to scare it away. In general, you don't need to fear black bears in Pennsylvania. You just need to respect them.
Black bears feed on a wide variety of both plant and animal matter. They often shift their diet from one substance to another, depending on the distribution, abundance, and availability of foods. This omnivorous, opportunistic feeding strategy has served bears very well for many thousands of years, but with the recent increasing interactions with humans, this strategy can lead to their demise. In recent years, a major immigration of humans into some of Pennsylvania's best bear habitat has occurred. In many cases, the bears have adapted to this encroachment amazingly well, continuing to survive and, in some cases, actually thriving within the confines of large human developments. But this adaptation has brought about mixed blessings with an increase in man-bear encounters and in amounts of bear damage and nuisance. In Pennsylvania, most bear problems occur in the spring and the fall. The greatest frequency of damage and nuisance occurs when natural foods are scarce. Shortages of natural foods come about in many ways. When gypsy moths defoliate oak forests to where July scenes look like winter scenes, there won't be any acorns to eat come fall. A drought or late frost may also destroy potential berry crops. And when this happens, bears turn to man-related foods to meet their energy needs. And that's when the trouble begins. The most common bear problems involve garbage. Bears upset garbage cans and carry off the stuffed plastic liners like lunch bags. They tip over dumpsters, and they dig up and haul away garbage from sanitary landfills, causing problems between landfill owners and inspectors. Garbage problems are especially common where bears live nearly their entire lives in human developments. One area where we studied the conflicts between humans and bears was in a development called Hemlock Farms. This development consists of about 5,000 acres, 3,000 homes, 55 miles of paved roads, 10,000 people, and believe it or not, over 20 bears. These cubs represent the sixth generation of bears we've monitored in this development in the past 17 years. Their great-great-great-grandmother raised 29 offspring in one decade, and to the best of my knowledge, that's a world's record. We've been shocked at how well bears can adapt to high human densities if given a chance, but there are conflicts. We've been receiving reports of this bear causing garbage problems in hemlock farms, so we decided to follow her and see what she was doing. For the next few minutes, you can see for yourself just some of the things she got into during a five-hour period one morning that we monitored her. We watched this bear check out over a hundred different garbage cans, and in most cases, the residents never even knew she was there. In this case, the residents were sleeping inside the house while she was rummaging through their garbage on the back deck. Notice how conveniently the bear uses their stairs. The garbage raiding teacher and her mimicking twin students meandered from house to house in search of food supplements. She's become an expert at opening garbage bins and checking out to see what's in it for her. The garbage man had made his rounds the day before, so most garbage cans were empty, and those that weren't didn't appear to have much edible food in them. But the female bear wasted little time in changing her strategy for satisfying her appetite. She treed her cubs and began walking rapidly in a straight line directly south and left the development.
She continued for about a mile, right to a feeder filled with pastries and corn, where she gorged herself. After her big meal, she stopped in the front yard and began scratching her back on the shrubbery. And judging from the appearance of this pine sapling, this isn't the first time a bear has used it as a scratching post. Once her immediate needs were met, she reversed directions and started back north. She walked at a fast pace, directly back to the cubs, as if she had a compass. She covered over two miles in less than 20 minutes. When natural foods are available, bears can live in human developments almost undetected. But when foods are scarce, they can cause chronic nuisance problems. Sometimes bears raid bird feeders and eat the bird seed or suet. They don't know that it's bird feed. They feel that it's bear feed. But few owners are sympathetic to the bear's opportunistic feeding. Homeowners who move into bear country from the city thought they had problems with squirrels raiding their feeders. But at least when the squirrels were done, the feeders were still left hanging. Bears will capitalize on just about any situation where food is obtainable. Even groceries left in an unattended car is fair game. The larger, more dominant bears have first rights on the best natural feeding areas, causing smaller submissive bears to look elsewhere. And it's these submissive bears that are more likely to turn up in nuisance situations like this one. But because of their low status in the pecking order, they're hypervigilant and nervous about being confronted by another bear. And if you don't think so, Watch this bear's reaction to his own reflections in the window. Many well-meaning people place foods such as bread, pastries, corn, or suet in their backyards to attract bears. This creates a popular recreational pastime for many people but unfortunately, it often increases bear problems and sometimes, ironically, results in the death of the very bears they're trying to help. A more serious problem is when people try to tame bears by attracting them to take food from their hands. In one bizarre case, a woman routinely held marshmallows in her lips while bears would stand up on their hind legs and remove the marshmallows with their lips. In several other cases, people have tempted bears into their houses using food. In these cases, they are enormously increasing their chances of being mauled and are guaranteeing the bear will soon die. 
either by approaching the wrong person or by breaking into houses where they're not welcome. One such bear broke into the house of Bob and Marcia Scrubba near Ridgeway in Elk County. Even though they weren't feeding the bear, they became unexpected victims of its modified behavior. Well, it was about 2.30 in the morning, and my wife woke me up, and she said, Bobby, Bobby, there's somebody in the kitchen. So I listened, I jumped up, there's crash, crash, crash. So I jumped up, and she says, you better grab something to hit him with. I said, oh, no, I don't have a gun. <laughs> Here I am living, I don't have a gun. And I thought, well, I don't have nothing in the bedroom to hit this guy with. You know, I thought for sure it was a guy. It was a 100% guy. So I jump up and run out there. And I go around the corner in the kitchen. And I was scared to death. And I just yelled, hey. And I looked around the corner. And here's this bear standing in the middle of my kitchen. <laughs> OK? And his back was, he was about 29 inches Mommy. over his back, I figured, because he's just a little bit under table height. OK? Mommy. And I thought, oh my God. So I grabbed the cellar door and tried to use it for protection. When it, you know, I'm looking at this thing, I didn't know what, what to do. He didn't look like he was going to attack me or nothing. So I just started screaming and yelling, going, shoot, get, go, get, screaming and dancing around on the floor in my underwear. And <laughs> he backed up a couple steps and then I kept screaming and screaming. And then he walked out the door and he ran down these steps here. And I hurry up and shut the sliding glass door. And, I come back, or I went, she come out then, and here the bear come right back up again the second time. And I, I just run over, and he ran right back down again. He was scared the second time. And then he took all the food out of the cupboards and brought it out here. You could see where he munched out, and he ripped the door off. And then two days later, he come back, and we had the door locked that time, the glass door, and he took the screen door and he ripped it right off a minute and a half, and he jumped up on the glass. And he's rocking on the glass, and he was about as tall as I was standing up. You know, I'd say he was six foot, real close to it. Occasionally, bears come to campsites in search of food, especially if they've been rewarded by finding things to eat there in the past. They not only tear apart tents, coolers, and convertible cars to find something to eat, sometimes they either destroy or walk off with things that don't seem to make any sense from a nutritional standpoint, like this boot. Bears occasionally come into towns looking for food and wind up getting treed. Soon a crowd develops and it becomes necessary to remove the bear. In this case, a mother bear and her three cubs strayed into town and got treed. The mother finally came down, but the cubs wouldn't follow. So she stayed in the area, causing a major disturbance. Officer Dennis Jones was called in and immobilized the mother bear, but the cubs remained hiding in a crown of a nearby hemlock. Because the cubs were young, it was necessary to relocate the entire family together. Dennis had to climb the tree to get the cubs. He was able to get two of them in a sack and lower them down on a rope, but one was way out on the end of a limb where he couldn't reach. So he decided to recruit the help from the crowd below. They stretched a large net out to catch the cub as Dennis shook it from a large limb far above. Don't trip on them rocks. Wrap him up. Wrap him up. Wrap him up. Okay, okay, wait, we'll get a grab. Once all the cubs were captured, they were placed in a cover trap with their mother and relocated out of town to a state game lands nearby. Even though bears can navigate home from up to 80 miles, bears relocated out of towns rarely return to urban areas again. One bear problem which involves extensive property and monetary damage is that concerning beehives. Most people know bears are fond of honey, and they'll eat large amounts of it when it's available. But few are aware of the bear's fondness for the bees, particularly bee larvae developing within the hive. They'll often eat pounds of bees and honey at a single sitting. And this makes sense nutritionally because the honey is high in carbohydrates, and the bees are high in protein, so they get a well-balanced meal. But such destruction 
is a real problem for the beekeeper. Daryl Reebok is a commercial beekeeper in north central Pennsylvania who's had many unpleasant experiences with bears. He shares his views of bear problems and their solutions. The conflict seems to arise because of an exceptionally large population of black bears. And in many cases, such as this year, we have problems in, the, in our area of Pennsylvania with the gypsy moth, which means that in the fall, we probably won't have an oak or acorn supply to feed bears as well as some other animals. This means then that the bears must resort to another type of food in order to continue growing and surviving. And this then creates more of a problem. Also, our bears seem to have adapted to living in farming areas and also next to towns where many beekeepers uh, maintain their colonies and their hives instead of staying out in the more wilder areas and the mountainous areas of Pennsylvania. So this has a tendency to uh, cause more conflict between bears and beekeepers. We have a lot of problems with bears uh, and the only way that we found to be successful most of the time to keep them out of the bees is with an electrified barbed wire fence. Um, no other fencing seems to work very well. Uh, even smooth wire, which is electrified, uh, a bear will learn to slide in between the wires and because of the thick coat that they have, they won't get an electric shock, whereas the barbed wire will go through the hair and uh, get to the skin where the bear will become sensitized. It seems once, once you get a bear to learn that there's electric in that fence, they will avoid it. And so that seems to be the major key in, uh, in getting bears to stay away from the beehives. And uh, we've been fairly successful. The greatest economic loss that bears create in Pennsylvania is to the crop of corn. During the fall, in areas where agricultural lands are interspersed with large forested tracts, bears sometimes damage cornfields by creating clear cuts in the center of the field. Most often, the damage is done when the corn is in the milk stage, usually during September and the farmer doesn't discover it until he harvests several weeks later. Consequently, the damage has been done. The bear is usually long gone before the farmer ever even knows what happened. Dale Peters is a commercial crop farmer in Clinton County who raises hundreds of acres of corn for a living. When bears began destroying his crops, he contacted George Mock, the local wildlife conservation officer. George came and investigated his complaint to assess the damage. Unless you've walked through a cornfield pillaged by bears like this, it's hard to believe just how much damage they can do. They flatten entire areas, pull piles of stalks together, flop down and gorge themselves. And it doesn't take much time for bears to cause thousands of dollars of damage once they get into a field of ripe corn. Well, I'm not planting corn to feed game. I'm planting corn yeah, and crops to make a life, to have a livelihood. No, I understand. The more of these, the more hunters you can get in an area like this, the more you're going to get oh, out yeah. of here. Yeah, it's amazing how many, how many bears can run around an area, even with uh, with a lot of hunters, and they just don't see them. They just They're slick them. buggers. They eh? sure are. <laughs> a lot of territory around them. <laughs> Never a variety of techniques have been developed and tested to avert bear damage and nuisance, but because of the bear's intelligence and their ability to discriminate and habituate, it's an extremely difficult task, and one which hasn't been very successful. For most conflicts between man and bear, there's no simple solution. These conflicts are not just an inconvenience. In some cases, such as corn damage, they represent large economic losses. It's these conflicts and losses that make it necessary to control Pennsylvania's black bear population. And hunting is how we regulate the number of bears that exist in our state. But when we hunt bears in Pennsylvania, how do we know what the impact of this hunt is on the bear resource? Well, to determine this, each year hundreds of bears throughout Pennsylvania are captured and tagged by biologists, conservation officers, and technicians. Records of each captured bear are loaded into computers, and we keep track of how many are available during each harvest. In Pennsylvania, it's mandatory that when a hunter shoots a bear, that he bring it into the Game Commission check stations. And at these check stations, officers collect information on each bear brought in, including the tag numbers of marked bears, the sex and weight of the bear, and they pull a premolar tooth so we can determine its age. 
And from this information, we evaluate the impact of the harvest by looking at what percent of the tag bears that were available actually got harvested. And over the years, these tag returns and information from radio collared bears have taught us much about the vulnerability of bears to hunting. We've learned that bear harvests are influenced by many factors. We know that older bears are less vulnerable to hunting than younger bears. And it appears that differential behavioral patterns is what causes this. Older bears are more nocturnal. They spend most of their daylight hours in dense cover, and when disturbed are less likely to flee from that cover. But younger bears, on the other hand, tend to be more active during daylight hours than older bears. And they're also more likely to run from dense cover when disturbed. And it's these differences in activity patterns that make younger bears more vulnerable to be seen and shot by hunters who are only allowed to hunt during daylight hours. Food abundance in the fall also appears to influence bear harvests. Food shortages causes earlier denning, which in turn causes lower harvests. Pregnant females tend to den earlier than the other bears, and depending on food conditions each year, between 25 and 75 percent of all pregnant females are denned by our late November bear hunting season. This reservoir of pregnant females, den and unavailable to hunters, gives us additional protection against overharvest. Weather conditions during the short hunting season also has a great impact on the size of bear harvest as well. If it rains or is extremely cold, bear activity decreases. Hunters don't stay in the woods as long, and harvests are low. Also, the number of sportsmen that hunt obviously influences how many bears will be taken. The number of bear hunters increased dramatically through the 1970s, reaching a peak of over 200,000 before we reduced the number allowed to hunt in 1981. It's the goal of the Pennsylvania Game Commission to establish and maintain black bear populations throughout their present and potential range within levels compatible with human use. But to reach this goal, we need to answer several basic questions. How many bears are there? And where are they? How many should there be? And what management programs are best to adjust bear populations to an optimum level? To answer the question, where are the bears, we review locations reported from harvest statistics, road kills, captures and observations of bears. We determine how many bears there are based on the proportion of tagged bears that are shot and the total number harvested during each hunting season. How many bears should there be in Pennsylvania? Well, the answer to this question depends on who you ask and what their experiences have been. If you ask someone who's had property damage from bears, then many times their response is, the only good bear is a dead bear. For those whose ideologies are along the lines of protectionism, no matter how many bears we have, they would like to see more. They believe that bears should live in peace and harmony with nature. The Pennsylvania Game Commission, charged with the responsibility of proper management of our Commonwealth's wildlife resources, recognizes that it's not possible to please all of the people, even some of the time. Economic losses and nuisance to the citizenry caused by bears must be weighed against the benefits they create for the public. And of all the questions that must be answered in our bear management program, how many bears should there be is the most difficult to answer because there are many possible solutions and no single one is the only correct solution. Bears, like most animal species, if allowed to increase their population indefinitely, should theoretically reach a point where food resources will be insufficient resulting in lower rates of growth, reproduction, and survival. The land can only support so many animals and no more. This is referred to as biological carrying capacity. In response to our bear management programs, Pennsylvania's bear population has roughly tripled in the past 15 years, with approximately 7,500 bears currently living in the Keystone State. With an increase of this magnitude, one would expect a reduction in the rate of growth and reproduction as the bear population approaches its biological carrying capacity. However, even at this higher population density, Pennsylvania black bears are growing more rapidly than for any other population of black bears studied in North America, and are reproducing at a rate higher than any studied population of bears of any species anywhere in the world. What this tells the Game Commission is that biologically, Pennsylvania is capable of supporting many more bears than we currently have, perhaps over 20,000 bears. Human bear conflicts and human attitudes toward bears currently are more responsible for determining how many bears Pennsylvania can support 
than food or cover conditions. The 12 million people who live in Pennsylvania would not tolerate the number of bears the state is capable of supporting biologically. That's one of the main reasons why we hunt bears, to keep their numbers and associated damage and nuisance levels compatible with current human use. Under present conditions, a population of bears in Pennsylvania of about 7,500 is believed to be reasonable and in line with the Game Commission's goal. To keep a bear population of this size stable, we know that about 1,500 bears need to be harvested annually. But what management plan should we put into effect? Should we have short seasons with large numbers of hunters or longer seasons with fewer hunters? Should we have a number of separate seasons for various weapons? Or should we have one season and let the hunters pick their weapons of choice? Purely from a population management standpoint, it matters little how the harvest takes place. What matters most is that the right numbers of bears are taken in the right areas. But there are many different ways we could harvest the right number of bears. The answer to which management plan should be implemented is more sociological than biological. In our society, the public ultimately decides which methods should be used to control the bear population. There are more bears in Pennsylvania today over a greater range than probably at any point during this century. We often hear our fathers and grandfathers talk about the abundance of wildlife back in the good old days. But when it comes to bears in Pennsylvania, these are the good old days. Bears here in Pennsylvania have exhibited an almost unbelievable ability to adapt to human encroachment, standing under interstate highways, hunting cabins, and even under houses. It's not been the bears that have lacked the ability to adapt, it's been the people. And quite often, it isn't what the bears have done that have gotten them into trouble, but rather what the people were afraid they might do. Our past efforts to educate the public about bears has paid high dividends, and the future of our bears depends very heavily on additional public relations. We now know that it isn't food or cover that limits how many bears we can maintain in Pennsylvania. It's human attitudes, and that's why we made this video. At no point in the history of this state has management of natural resources been scrutinized so intensively as it is today, and as it should be. As human populations continue to increase globally, while natural resources continue to decline, we can expect even greater scrutiny into the future, and even greater challenges to ensure the survival of our wildlands, our wildlife, and ultimately ourselves. We must work hard to secure the future of our natural resources. Our own future depends on it.